One more time. One more time. Good morning and welcome to opening sessions for spring 2023. I am Dr. Rochelle Isaac, faculty in the English department and president of faculty council. Before we begin our... <laughs> Thank you. Before we begin our program, I'd like to share a few brief announcements and reminders. First, the code survey has gone out. Faculty, please check your email and your and please check your email for your personal code survey link. As you know, your participation in this 25-minute survey is invaluable. Please note that the survey will be closed by early April. Members of our community are encouraged to celebrate each other throughout Women's History Month. Women from the community who wish to be featured on the DEI Instagram page can submit their photos on the DEI website, laguardia.edu slash DEI. Additional Women's History Month events hosted by the Women's Center and several campus partners can be found online on the campus calendar. The Sustainability Council is preparing for an April Earth Day celebration. Please check the campus update for the sign-up link. Also, please consider donating to LaGuardia Cares. Personal care items, toiletries, non-perishable foods, and monetary donations are very much appreciated. LaGuardia Cares continues to support thousands of LaGuardia students and community members each year. Your support is deeply appreciated. Our panelists are here so we can begin today's discussion. I think we have Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Dr. Eric Hoffman. <laughs> Adult and Continuing Education Interim Associate Dean, Asanta Howard. Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Billy Gastic Rosado. <laughs> Interim Associate Dean of Enrollment Management, Dr. Gail Basque Jarrett. <laughs> Senior Vice President for Administration and Finance, Shahi Afran. as well as our host, Chief of Staff, Nayeli valencia Turand, and, and President Kenneth Adams. <laughs> President Adams, to you. All right, let's a round of applause, please, for Professor Rochelle Eichert. In the English Department, Rochelle, thanks so much for your help. Rochelle will, Rochelle will be back up on the stage later on, uh, but uh, for now, uh, she'll take her seat with you. Thanks, everybody for being here. We have a big audience here in the Little Theater, and our colleagues who are watching this online now really can't see you. So make some noise and clap. A big round of applause for everybody who's here. And to indicate that uh, that's it. Big crowd, big crowd. Uh, for those of you dialing in, I want to uh, recognize and thank uh, two important colleagues. Uh, Susan Weinstein, our ASL interpreter, who's on the stage now, and her colleague, Amy Rubinger, who will come up when, and go back and forth with Susan to do our ASL signing this morning. Thank you both. Big thank you, of course, to the crew here at LPAC, the LaGuardia Performing Arts Center, uh, under the leadership of, of Evelyn Lomark and Carmen Griffin, and thank you, thank you for all your help. Now, for our opening sessions event this semester, I decided to return to the talk show format that we premiered on the same stage a year ago. Um, and if you didn't see last year's event, the idea is that instead of me doing a long-winded stem winder kind of convocation talk from that podium over there, I invite a bunch of friends up here and ask them questions. Uh, and you get to listen in. And I'm going to ask our guests this morning to answer questions that have come up around here in recent weeks, including questions from members of the LaGuardia Senate, some questions that were sent to us in advance uh, through uh, Manny's newsletter and the, the website, uh, and um, other just curious colleagues from off across the college. I will add that any of you in the audience here, this is a benefit of being here live and in person. You can go up to, there's a table in the back, and you can, there's a box for questions, and as long as you don't you know, disrupt the people sitting around you too much, feel free to go up and put a question in the box, and that's where Rochelle will come back at the end of the program and we'll take questions from the audience in that very high-tech manner. 
Um, now, our show's producers have seen some of these questions in advance, and they've grouped them by theme. So the information shared by our expert witnesses here comes across in a more coherent way, or so we hope. Now, and as your host, I have to say I'm interested in covering a few topics that I know many of you are interested in, like enrollment in the budget. So we're going to kind of start with those two topics uh, right away, meaning our first question in the morning uh, is going to go to Shahir. And this, I, have, I'm gonna, I have the questions on cards here. Um, question number one, as you have explained at Senate, Shahir, LaGuardia still has a budget deficit caused largely by our loss of enrollment and some city budget cuts last year and during the pandemic. So we have several questions for you. Number one, how will we address the college deficit this year, uh, the current fiscal year that ends on June 30th? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we project our deficit to be $10.7 million for this current year. Thanks to the measures we put in place in saving costs, and also thanks to federal government for the stimulus funds, I'm happy to tell you that we will balance our budget for this year. Well, what, what uh, I'm, someone asked this interesting question, it's not just LaGuardia, this is a problem all across CUNY. Because of the large structural deficit across the system, CUNY has announced uh, savings targets, right, for individual colleges for this fiscal year, and then new savings targets for fiscal year 24, the year that will start on July 1st. So what are the savings targets for LaGuardia, and how are we going to get there? So we have a savings target of $7.5 million for next year, starting July 1st until June 30th of the following year. There are two ways we can achieve those um, savings uh, that has been earmarked to us. One is through generating additional revenue. How do we do it? Uh, additional FTEs, uh, full-time enrollment or student enrollment. Increasing uh, bursar collection rate. Uh, we're also looking for non-tax levy offsets. Uh, thanks to our foundation, we're able to use $500,000 that they have approved for student debt collection, so that we could use as, as uh, uh, revenue for the college. And also we're looking for increasing revenue rentals, revenue through rental of facilities, parking, vending. So those are some of the measures we're considering in addition to other changes that, that uh, will result in, in reduced spending. Uh, the, the plan is due on March 17th to CUNY. We're working with Senate Budget and Finance Committee to, to, to hash out the differences, to look at the numbers, and present it to, to CUNY at that time. Shakir, we keep hearing that the VRV is back and there's a hiring freeze. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, as President Adams mentioned, uh, CUNY has a structural budget deficit system-wide. One of the things they, they, would they would do is to review all personnel actions, new hires, recruitments, reclassification, and many other items. And they have told us they, they will look at those. And also they will give priority approval to health and safety and also delivery of instruction. So uh, it's one of the steps for them to, to deal with the structural budget deficit for CUNY. Sure, here we've seen this VRB before, right, in the, during the pandemic. I hope that people at the central office understand that we have already reduced our headcount significantly for the last, the last few years. Um, and people are familiar with this when we don't, somebody retires or resigns and we don't replace that person. But it does mean there's a lot more work spread over fewer people. Can you be a little more specific? What, is, what has happened in, you know, to our LaGuardia headcount over the last few years? Yes, yeah, so the, last week we received some numbers from CUNY. They're aware of the, the, uh, the, the reduced number of full-time staffing at the college. Uh, in 2019, we had 1,106 full-time lines. Last week's number was 997. If my math, my math is right, it's 106 less full-time lines for the college uh, in the last four years. So yes, they're aware of it, and uh, uh, it's creating hardship for all of us. 
but it's one of the ways that we have to deal with our budget to, to balance our budget. Yeah, I think I just thank you, Shahir. That's that's like saying 10%. I mean, you go from 1,100 full time people to 1,000, roughly. Um, that's almost 10%. And uh, I think we all feel that, right? Because across the organization, again, people have to pitch in and work hard. And so, well, let's, let's hope this is recognized by the central office. It is some serious belt tightening that we have no choice but to do. Um, and thank you. Thanks for shedding some light on that. Let's move over to Gail and talk a little bit about enrollment. Gail, um, look, spring, uh, spring one classes start tomorrow here. We're doing this event today. Uh, so you know what everyone is anxious about. How is enrollment looking for the spring semester that starts tomorrow? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Spr <laughs> spring. We are closing in on our target, and we are doing really well with our freshmen and transfer students. And I'd like to say, um, based on data that we have, we have been able to um, implement initiatives to strengthen our freshman and new student enrollment for spring 23. Can you be a little more specific, yeah, like the, the you've, we're up in terms of freshmen, for, again, for starting tomorrow, new students, uh, which is not easy for the spring semester, right? Students typically come in the fall. And also, I think you said transfers, but you left out continuing students. Can you shed, be a little more specific? For our spring 23, our, our admissions, freshmen, and transfer applications increased 15.8% mm -hmm. compared to where we were last year. Okay. This is the highest in the CUNY system amongst the CUNY community colleges. We implemented a call campaign to new freshmen and transfers, and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our faculty and our staff who assisted in this initiative, as well as thank you to the enrollment management staff for their hard work. We are, our returning students are a challenge. And we really need to strengthen our strategies and our efforts in that regard. And that is what I'm looking forward to. Gail, I always worry about the bursar cancellations on our students. Can you tell us the latest? When students register, they receive notices via email and texts of payment deadlines. Unfortunately, when payment is not made, students risk being canceled. Financial aid staff work closely with Bursa staff to minimize the number of students being canceled. We were able to protect over 400 students from cancellations for spring 23. We also implemented a debt initiative for our continuing students. We received $100,000 from the foundation so far this year. We have been able to assist over 200 students with prior debt and they were able to enroll for spring 23. Gail, I just heard you, 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 you've spent $100,000, but you here has offered you, through the foundation, $500,000. I suspect you plan to spend the remaining $400,000 to help students with Correct. With right? Correct. That work is ongoing and is in progress. As we speak, staff are working diligently to award those funds to students experiencing financial hardship. Right. And so, Friends in the audience, remember, LaGuardia's bursar hold is $500, right? If, you, if you're a student with an unpaid balance in excess of $500, as you go to register, you're locked out from, from doing your schedule. So to release, you have to have that hold released. And to do that, you have to see Gail and her team. Uh, and you can receive, students can receive some debt relief from the foundation. I think we're the only CUNY school doing that now. I want to salute uh, our new foundation executive director, Jay Golan, who got the board of trustees of the foundation to approve that. That's not a typical thing to do with foundation resources. Um, but it means we can help students who are somewhere usually between $500 and $1,000 or even $1,500 of outstanding debt, bring it back to at least $500, put them on a payment plan, and get them back in class, correct? Correct. And I'd also like to add that spring classes begin tomorrow. Students have until Monday, March 13th to add classes for session one, and they will have another opportunity to add classes for session two at the end of April. That's helpful. Um, while you have the microphone, Gail, what's your crystal ball say about fall enrollment? 
Our fall 2023 applications are looking really good at this time. We have over 17,000 freshmen and transfer applications in the pipeline, which is a 2.8% increase from where we were last year. Overall, CUNY freshman applications are down minus 1.5%. CUNY has implemented a waiver for the freshman applications through April 15th, and I believe with this waiver we will be able to considerably increase our applications, and hopefully it will result in an increased enrollment for fall 2023. Is that waiver in effect now? It, it is in effect now. Right. It went into effect March 1st, and it will end April 15th. Right. So I think people saw the announcement. It's, it's followed an announcement, a similar announcement by SUNY in the fall of waiving, in our case, the $65 application fee for students, New York City High School DOE students who are thinking about college for the fall now, to waive that for a six week period, right? Yes, So yes. That, that should give us a big bump in applications. I think, Gail, it's fair to say, yes. it's a long road from a student applying, you know, showing an interest in LaGuardia, to actually getting them registered for class and here for the fall. Correct. But, um, but it's good, obviously it's a good, I'm sure you agree that the CUNY campaign to do that uh, can only be helpful. Yes. Right, along with a lot of advertising going on. Everyone's seen the new ads. We've been pushing for this, so we're happy to see the citywide MTA and out-of-home ad campaign um, to drive enrollment across the system. Nayeli, um, you know, backstage before we came on, you were telling us about some important news related to the DEI work, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work that, that Wendy Nicholson, who I see back here, <laughs> Uh, that Wendy is leading. So, so what's going on? So this week, One La Guardia is actually launching a competition. As we all know, La Guardia is compromised with a diverse uh, body of students, faculty and staff. And each person has their background and the history that fits into the dynamic work and learning environment that we have. Our college promotes, of course, opportunity and learning experiences that are equitable inclusive and diverse. So we are one La Guardia. And there's actually a really cool video that I would like to show. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, this week, faculty, staff, and students are actually invited to participate in an artwork and video competition. And this competition gives participants the opportunity to express themselves through art and video in the spirit of advancing diversity. So please keep an eye on more information from our um, executive director of DEI, Wendy Nicholson. Nayeli, thank you, and a uh, round of applause again for the team that put that video together. That's Wendy Nicholson, Manny Romero, Carlos, Gina, our great, our great communications team. Thanks a lot. And uh, now, Nayeli, I know I, I have a feeling there's more going on in this spring semester. Um, 
while we mark our calendars for that, are there other things you want to mention while you've got everybody's attention here? Yes, there's uh -huh. actually plenty of stuff, and I, I have my shit sheet. So, open house at La Casa, this Wednesday, March 8th. There's a lot of cool things happening at La Casa, so please check them out. Mindfulness meditation sessions are going to be through spring. They do it through Zoom every Wednesday or at the atrium at 1. The annual transfer fair is also coming March 29th. Uh, spring Fest, with collaboration with Casa de las Americas, have um, a student life for March 29th. La Guardia is also hosting the CUNY LGBTQI plus student conference March 31st. Popo Plaza events are going to happen from April 19th through June 7th every Wednesday. April 21 to 28th is Black Lives Matter Summit. Uh, in May, there's uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage and the committee is working on the events. May 17 to the 20th, there's our theater spring production, Big Love, this is like fresh news. And of course, we're planning our commencement on June 21st, that is on the way. So keep an eye on the campus updates that is sent every Wednesday and also at La Guardia website. That's a lot. Yeah. You got a lot going on. Thank you, Nayeli. Um, but come, let's go back to the pop-up plaza. Why are there so many of these pop-up plaza events over on 29th Street? So as you remember, uh, last spring we had two events. One actually was a right now, but we had an event when we closed 29th Street. This is a street that is between the C building and the parking lot. And we need to show uh, DOT that we actually need this space for us. So the, the long run is to close that street. Uh, we apply for open streets. Um, uh, through DOT, and so there are going to be eight Wednesdays when the street is going to be closed, and there's going to be a lot of fun events, workshops, music, etc. So when you announce those, everybody has to show up, go out to 29th Street, and have fun, right? Oh yeah, everybody's going to hear everybody from us. Yes. yes. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, um, Nayeli. Thanks very much for those announcements. Let's get back to our panel discussion. Um, you know, I want to ask you about some new research and planning that's been happening since late last year that I know some of you are involved in. On several occasions, we put the word out, we invited people to participate in three new volunteer committees, since there are not enough activities like this already at LaGuardia Committee College. Um, these committees, which we call Priority Initiative Working Groups, were the result of a cabinet retreat that I hosted last summer, back in August. Um, the goal of that retreat was to identify initiatives that would enable us to improve student success while also working to ensure that LaGuardia would remain uh, a compelling, supportive, attractive place to work, especially as we emerge from the pandemic. So I announced the launch of these three planning teams, you may recall, back in November. There are three of them, advising, guided pathways, and professional development. Now, as luck would have it, co-chairs of these three groups happen to be sitting on the stage before us today. So let's get started. I want to go to, um, let's start with Eric, because I haven't seen Eric in a while. Um, Eric, you co-chair, along with our VP of Adult and Continuing Education and Workforce Development, Sunil Gupta, the new working group focused on guided pathways. I know there's some questions about your committee and the work you're doing, so first, tell us about the group and your first few meetings. Okay. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Um, our working group for guided pathways consists of 25 members who represent five divisions, um, five academic departments, and we've met five times. <laughs> Um, Stop right there. <laughs> uh, we've been learning about the Guided Pathways model and specifically how LaGuardia can best help students um, learn uh, and start college with a clear understanding of different academic and career paths um, and also to ensure that they will persist and graduate. Um, in these group, we've done a lot of reading. We've discussed those readings in large and small groups. We've looked at some of our current LaGuardia practices. And because there is the word work in working group, um, folks have met outside of the meeting time to work in small groups around inquiry projects. Um, some of the things they've looked at is um, how students learn about and choose their major before they apply, and also what resources they're using the first time that they register for classes. Um, we also got to meet with members of the advising working group uh, about halfway through just to get their perspective on some of our preliminary work. Eric, um, tell us more about guided pathways. I mean, you use the term, but what does it mean? What is it? 
Yeah, so Guided Pathways is a framework uh, to help community colleges um, really working with uh, students to make sure that they have an understanding of college and to address their motivation really to start college and persist. They're really trying to address degree completion with Guided Pathways. Um, it's, it's intended especially, I would say, for first generation and low income students so they can make clear connections between academic study and the career interests that they have. Um, it's been supported by research, uh, primarily from the Brookings Institute, Community College Research Center, um, and Aspen. Uh, and they've seen significant gains in retention and completion for colleges that are implementing some of these strategies, and sometimes uh, more than 20% in graduation. Eric, you did our LaGuardia application to Aspen to the Aspen Excellence Prize and we became a semi-finalist last year. Did you come across some of the Guided Pathways examples in that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, I think one of the things is, uh, as the President Adams mentioned, there are some things that we're doing already. Um, this confirms uh, and affirms the work that we've been doing. Um, but we also see from an equity perspective, we looked at data pretty closely. And we were, what was great about the Aspen uh, Prize was we got to meet with and look at data from colleges across the country, and we would uh, disaggregate uh, from an equity lens. We see where LaGuardia is doing well, and we see where there's room for improvement. So what, um, what's your group's goal? I mean, where you've met five times, you're continuing to meet this semester. You know, where are you going with this? Yeah, so first, um, I wanna thank uh, everyone who is part of this group. Uh, we're delighted that so many people are interested in volunteering their time. Um, and also learning about Guided Pathways. So that's a small goal, is just really understanding and unpacking what Guided Pathways is. Our larger goal, though, is to learn what elements uh, that we're implementing effectively already um, and where we have gaps uh, that we want to address. It could be small tweaks. Other, in other places, we really need to um, rethink our approaches, or we can rethink our approaches to some of the ways we've been doing things. Um, the last thing that I would say is that um, we're going to write a report that comes out of this with recommendations around, um, again, the things we've been doing well. I think first year seminar with this use of ePortfolio and peer mentoring has been really helpful. We've seen noticeable gains for students who take it in their first semester, uh, as well as degree maps, which are helpful for students to understand that pathway. Um, but we see collectively where there is this room for improvement, and those are the recommendations that we'll make in this report. Great, great, thanks very much. Eric, are you still looking for volunteers? How can people still get involved? Yeah, um, absolutely. So with 25 people, obviously uh, some people have to meet, uh, miss some meetings. So people have come in and out of these meetings. So we've recorded them and we put working documents together. So if someone wants to join us for these last two meetings, um, they can get up to speed by looking at those resources. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, if, even if the college adapts just one or two of these practices, we think it'll make significant improvements. But if we follow this whole strategy of implementing at a at broader scale, um, I think that the report will help shape that work and there should be more opportunities for people to get involved in the future. Right, so safe to say um, anyone who wants to learn more can email you and, and get involved in that. Yeah, email me or BP Gupta and we'll get you into our Zoom meetings. <laughs> right, great, thanks. Eric, thank you. And um, let, let's turn to the second uh, working group. And we've got Asanta. Uh, Asanta, you uh, co-chair with Marta Clark, our interim executive director of HR, who I see in the audience somewhere. Hi, Marta. Good morning. A working group devoted to professional development. So again, just start out with how How's the committee? Who's, how many people, you know, how many meetings? What's going on with the committee? And then we'll talk a little more about the work. Good morning, President Adams and everyone. Um, so our professional development uh, group has about 16 members, and it's a mix of faculty and staff. And we've met twice. Um, we've met in person. And uh, we intend on meeting uh, about four, four more times. And our goal is to um, develop a list of recommendations. But it's really about um, the pathways to professional development. How do we get there? So these recommendations will be provided you know, to our president and, um, and recommendations of professional development, the reasons for it, and how we can go about implementing it. 
Can you tell us, I mean, you've met twice, what are some of the areas or themes people seem to care about? Well, one of the big things are uh, leadership, uh, leadership development, uh, supervisory training, and one interesting thing came up about mentorship. And so mentorship, sustainability of professional development, because you just don't want to do it for a year. You want this to be ongoing. Um, another one that we came up with, technical, technical skills. And another big thing is how do we finance it? That's why you look at me. I noticed that. <laughs> Did we come up with a bunch of recommendations for workshops, seminars, guest speakers, and deliver to the president? Like, I have to, uh, I, um, yeah, I'm glad it's a team effort. And we have HR and other resources. And of course, I'll support it. We'll support it, uh, the administration will, in any way we can. But very curious to see. I think some of this plays off of the staff engagement survey, right? Asante yes. was done a couple during the pandemic. Right. And I believe um, there's another staff engagement survey that will be administered this spring. Um, so, I mean, Professor Isaac mentioned the upcoming co or the current coach survey, but staff again will have a chance to talk about, I'm sure in that survey, mm -hmm. um, provide information and guidance, ideas, suggestions around professional development as well. Well, thanks, Asanta. Good luck, and good luck to, to you and Marta and the group. Um, the, uh, the, the, the third group, as I mentioned, was about advising. Billy, you co-chair with Dr. Faye Butler. I think I see Faye out there. There she is. Our Interim Associate Dean for Student Affairs, a working group that's looking into advising at LaGuardia. First question, however, advising was recently moved from student affairs to academic affairs. It's that, and that's where advising is now. Um, how is that going? Um, how'd the move go? Why'd you do it? And how's it working? I want to thank uh, Dr. Butler for ensuring that this has been a smooth transition. We made the official move in February for advising for um, our ASAP, our, S our SAS, and our uh, college discovery advisors all moving over to, to academic affairs. Um, and so I'm, I'm very appreciative to, to her uh, partnership in, in making sure that that goes smoothly. Uh, the, the purpose behind that is to ensure that we do everything that we can to avoid any obstacles uh, that are standing in the way between faculty and our staff advisors for working as effectively together as a team as possible. Uh, students experience us as one LaGuardia, right? They, they want consistency of, of message and guidance. And so the idea of bringing both groups of colleagues together is, is to, to make that happen easier and faster. And how is your group going? How many people roughly? Uh, how many meetings? What's happening with the logistics? So we started meeting in January. We're meeting about every two weeks. And there are more than a dozen colleagues from across the college who have joined us. Uh, and as the other uh, task of the other groups have mentioned, a nice mix of, of faculty and staff. And, and something that I've just been uh, just so impressed by is, you know, Faye and I were preparing for, we'll do some icebreakers. We'll, we'll get people comfortable with each other. Day one, people came full of ideas and enthusiasm and determination uh, to, to make this work what we know it can be, and so that's very motivating. And in the end, uh, what do you hope to get done? Do you have a deadline? I mean, it sounds like you're following a path of the other work groups. So we, we recognize that this work is, is ongoing. The, the work of this particular group that is committed through, to meet through March is develop a, a set of recommendations, some that are coming to the provost's office as I think about uh, you know, the ongoing transition, but much of them are going to the advising council. This is an existing body uh, that is housed within academic affairs where program directors from the academic departments come together with advisors and other staff on a regular basis. And so our interest is to leverage an existing uh, vehicle and group instead of meetings uh, as a place where we can work on some of the communication issues and continue uh, the conversations that have started in the smaller working group. Billy, you mentioned the importance of, of faculty, faculty working with our professional advisors, working together. Can you talk a little bit of, of more about that, about your vision for that? So what's really interesting is that, um, you know, both faculty and staff advisors have talked about the importance of students having availability to both, or access to both generalists and specialists. 
and there is a recognition that our staff advisors can and should serve as, as uh, our generalists, and but we need our, fac our academic faculty to serve as a specialist because the, the, no one knows one's field or uh, transfer pathway trajectory or potential career paths like our faculty. And so it's that working together that both sides are committed to and I see the role of academic affairs to, to helping you know, um, eliminate any, any obstacles to, to them doing that work well. Thanks, Billy. Um, let me just say again, I think it's clear, but anyone who wants to get involved in any one of the three working groups, they're open, um, always need volunteers, new ideas, and help, and they'll continue their work, the three different projects all through this semester, and then wrap up with their reports. I think it's time to see if we have any questions from the audience and so I'd like to see if Dr. Rochelle Isaac from the English Department, our host and moderator, will come back on stage. And I guess, Rochelle, the first thing I have to ask you is, are there any questions from the audience? If not, we have a shorter program for you this morning. Uh, what happened with class cancellations last week? Could you give us an update? So I am... Uh, and I, I want to say it's in, in partnership with the chairs, and I'm, I'm very appreciative to their, to their commitment to this. Uh, you know, there are some, uh, as has been discussed before, we have some decreases in enrollment that are impacting our ability to, uh, to offer the same number of courses or classes that we have in the past. Uh, but chairs have been working with, with program directors very uh, intentionally to help us provide a schedule that is better aligned with our enrollment. And the good news is as, as we get better at this work, one schedule rolls into the next semester, and so it makes the impact of lower enrollment uh, something that we have to experience less. Uh, so I'm very grateful to, uh, to the chairs and the program directors for doing that work. And also when it comes to can class cancellations, being very creative uh, and, and innovative about how we can reduce the impact of students. Uh, you know, the last, there's a, there's a balance that we need to strike between making sure that we are, you know, using our resources well and being fiscally responsible and mindful of the constraints that we're under, but we also don't want to be disruptive to students. Uh, and we know that a st class cancellation can cause a cascade of, uh, of impacts, including changes to financial aid, and so wanted to uh, you know, do what we can to reduce the, the impact of that. And, and together with chairs, you know, there is um, a good number of compromises uh, that, that make me very comfortable about our ability to, to strike that balance. So you will see, and some it, some it may be true for some of the classes that you teach, we are running some classes at, you know, fewer than, than 10 students because we understand that not doing so would be very disruptive to students' trajectory, capstone classes, intro classes to majors, uh, and so it's that, it's that ongoing conversation with departments that's, that's making that all possible. Thank you, Billy. This question is for Shahir. A number of faculty and staff who work in the B building have been complaining about conditions there. Representatives of our PSE chapter visited President Adams last week and gave him petitions urging the administration to address the B building concerns so what is the administration doing to improve conditions in the B building? Thank you, Rochelle. Yes, I did receive those messages uh, loud and clear. Uh, there were concerns about HVAC. There were concerns about uh, quality of life and water in the building. Uh, the first thing I, I do is rely on the expertise and expert advice of, of our Office of Environmental Health and Safety for any safety issues on campus. So that's, that's for me, that's not negotiable because that's, that, that's the officer's job. Two, we, we have put in additional maintenance crew in the B building to address some of these quality of life issues. And you've seen it for the last three weeks. They have made a lot of progress. We'll continue to do it to address replacement of ceiling tiles, painting, uh, flooring, so those things are work in progress. We're also working with the landlord to improve areas that are under their control, like entrance, uh, atrium areas. So the lighting, uh, we're working with the uh, city as a long-term solution to, to replace 
majority of the lighting throughout the campus, especially in the B building, to improve lighting levels. We will make the changes in the short term until we get the full funding and, and the work that starts by the city. We're uh, also renewing the lease for the B building. As part of the negotiation, we asked for all HVAC units to be replaced because the newer ones are you are able to be controlled through a computer or also can see the alarms. I'll give you an example, uh, a unit that was built similar in, in the building, the built in 20, 25 years ago, if the unit goes down, we would not know. And it, we rely on folks who are in those areas to, to let us know if the unit is down for whatever reason, mechanical systems or, or some set points. So if we have them, the newer equipment obviously will be able to see it on computer and an alarm will flash on the computer screen says, hey, in this room, the HVAC unit is not running. And we could also control temperature and other. So those are the, some of the items that uh, we're handling. The work is in progress, will continue. I'm also committed to making additional visits with my team in the building so I could see conditions firsthand. Uh, talk to folks and uh, I also urge everyone in the building to call us when issues do come up, don't wait. Please call us when there's issues with lights, HVACs, uh, and anything, just let us know. You're our eyes and ears as well, so I can't be in every room, but please let's work together and uh, we, we are committed to making conditions better. Thank you, Shahir. So this can I just wanna, sorry, sure. I wanna just add something to that. And you're, the person who asked the question mentioned the PSC chapter coming to meet me with the petitions, and I want to recognize that. It was actually very helpful. It was last week, and the chapter leadership came to my office uh, with, yeah, a lot of petitions, Shahir knows, you know, regarding people's concerns about conditions in the B building, and I should say a second set of petitions urging that we not have any class cancellations. Um, and I believe it's Professor Lori Gluck is the liaison within the chapter around facilities issues. So I just wanted to remind people kind of as, as you were just saying to here, that if you do see something that you think is unhealthy or problematic from a safety standpoint uh, in the B building or anywhere, it's a, a good way to get that concern right to my attention is to go to the chapter. Lara, Lori, and others will bring it to our attention right away. So good communication there, and thank you, Shahir, for doing what you can do. I'm sorry, Rochelle, back to you. Oh, that's fine. This question is for Billy, and maybe you may jump in too. Last year, the Criminal Justice Program conducted a student satisfaction survey for its second PPR. A key finding was that over 70% of students want more online classes. Given that enrollment in criminal justice has dropped by over 40% since 2014, and there has been a proliferation of online criminal justice programs, including at CUNY and SUNY colleges, where does LaGuardia stand on the development of online programs and offering more online classes to meet student demand? That's a lot. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the question. So we, we've learned a lot from the pandemic, as, as many institutions have, and are committed to making sure that online learning is an option for students. I, you know, I, um, LaGuardia is a, a, a campus first uh, institution, institution, but but we recognize that uh, in order to promote student success, students are seeking flexibility, uh, and for some students that means having you know some online classes or hybrid classes, you know maybe once or twice a year, uh, and then for other students, especially adult learners uh, who are com are uh, juggling lots of different commitments, it may be that a fully online degree program is the difference between earning a college degree or not. So recognizing that we have a lot of different student needs to meet, I want to use the opportunity of the question to talk about three different arms of this work. Mm -hmm. uh, one, it relates to the online learning committee, the Senate's, the Senate's committee that provided a set of recommendations to several offices, including, the, including uh, academic affairs, in the fall semester, and we've been working, and the chairs and I have been looking at some of the recommendations too, to identify what are the, uh, you know, what are the things that we need to have in place as a college to make sure that all initiatives are served by a foundation. Uh, making a commitment to to continuing to do online education in a 
intentional way and less as a response to a, a global pandemic, uh, there are some things that now we want to take a step back and say, what do we need to do more of? Of course, we want to continue to provide faculty support in, in designing online programs and, and, and teaching uh, online, but also the point has been made to me uh, loud and clear that we have not done as much as we possibly could to support students in their decisions to whether or not to take an online course or what it means in terms of time management and, and other considerations. And so that is something that we have to invest a lot of time and attention with. So there's, there's that one piece about the committee's recommendation. Then there is a, uh, a initiative that you may have uh, been reading about at, that central that is seeking to uh, just increase the attention on the offerings that CUNY as a system provides online. And so we want we wanted, uh, we wanted to participate in that and do our role in that. And so what central has done is identify, has uh, done a bit of market research and identified a set of programs where they think uh, there's a real opportunity for, for us to reach many students online. And so uh, in ag agreeing and committing to uh, pursue those areas, Central is offering us a set of support in the form of some startup funds to, to facilitate uh, faculty involvement, and then also some support centrally from instructional designers and people who have done this before who can help uh, be available for, for counsel and advice. So that's a, that's a second prong of this. And then the third, and this you know, it applies to criminal justice and other programs, are academic department-driven initiatives, where academic departments have stepped forward and said, we really, you know, we're, we're partially online now, we really want to go fully online. Uh, and those are uh, conversations that will come up within academic affairs. There's a little bit, uh, we've, um, with Associate Dean Miller, We've introduced just, just a bit of a process there so that there's a, a, an opportunity to have a conversation when there are departments who are interested in, in going that route with a, a fully online program. Thank you, Billy. And this was for President Adams. In your fall closing sessions talk in December, you mentioned new ways to help LaGuardia students that are homeless or on the brink of becoming homeless. Can you give us an update on that? Thanks, Rochelle. Um, yes, and I think you mentioned LaGuardia Cares uh, in your opening remarks, and let me second what you said then, which is for people to please consider giving to LaGuardia Cares as we start the semester. There's a, there's a school supply, healthcare supply drive going on right now. <laughs> um, working with Rhonda Mouton, who runs LaGuardia Cares, we have two new programs that have just started. And actually, I appreciate this question because at the beginning of the semester, it's important for faculty to know that we have new resources for students who are homeless or facing homelessness because often it's faculty that find out or notice about a student in that terrible situation. Um, we have a relationship that Rhonda and I have developed with Airbnb and we use the platform, um, a customized version of it, to identify rooms available in Queens homes mm -hmm. and then Airbnb provides vouchers to students so they can get a room. This has been helpful. We had two students living in cars in the fall um, we've had other students in shelters and other students, one of a domestic violence situation, who needed a housing solution. Maybe more long term, we have a new relationship with a terrific organization called Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter, and Shaloff runs it, and they just acquired, well, they net leased a set of apartments in a building in Long Island City. And they're like suites, but you divide the rooms up, so it's almost like a dorm with it's a, a suite. And Medgar Evers students are living there now, and so is a LaGuardia student. And Anne has talked to me and Rhonda recently, she was here, about making more rooms available for LaGuardia students. We'll have to, I, I'm going to need to lean on uh, my friend Jay Golan at the foundation because we're going to have to raise some money to subsidize that. Um, but we do have those solutions in place. There was a time before the holidays when I said, Rhonda, you probably don't want me talking about this because you'll have too many students, literally, li unfortunately, you know, lined up outside of your door. And she said, no, that's fine. Talk about it, President Adams. I mean, we'll find ways to help students, and, and this is a time of year, for example, where Rhonda and her team are very, very good at helping students access all the federal benefits they may be eligible for. You're going to see something from me and Rhonda later this week about the importance. This is really, please tell your students, you don't probably talk about taxes too much in class, but it's tax filing season, and every year low-income New Yorkers fail to file for the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, 
which means we leave $2 billion of federal aid down in Washington for our friends in the capital to do with, do with what they want, instead of that coming to our communities in New York City. And that's because people don't file tax returns and claim the AITC, which is cash that comes back with your, your refund. It also triggers the state earned income credit. So Rhonda and I are putting out a blitz of information about this this week. Thank you, Manny Romero, again, for helping us communicate it. Um, along with a terrific article from The City, the online news source, which has a very good outline for this year on information for your taxes. So super important because this is how students access benefits. Um, and again, please um, contact Rhonda or me if you, need, if, you, if you have a situation with a student who needs support from some of our housing solutions. Thanks. Thank you. This one is for Billy, the provost. What do you think of LaGuardia after your first full year? <laughs> Wait, you've been here a year? No. No. Six months. <laughs> Feels, like Feels like a year. <laughs> you know, I'm, it just every day reinforces my decision and, and my gratitude for being invited to, to join this community. Uh, everyone is uh, just so committed to our students and for, for all of our differences in, in maybe opinions and, and ideas about how to get there, the fact that we can always connect and say what grounds us as the student is tremendously powerful and, and makes anything possible. So that, that's really uh, kind of that, that encouragement at the end of a long day that says, you know, this is, uh, you know, we, are, we, we dare to do more and we mean it. Uh, and so I am uh, just appreciative, and this is an opportunity for me just to thank so many of you who have been so generous with your time, be it in you know, department meetings or, or different group meetings where I came and, and visited with you and you shared suggestions and, and uh, sent me things to read and, and think, uh, videos to watch about our community. Uh, that has made all the difference in, in my onboarding and my ability to feel like a member of this community as quickly as I have. So I feel that embrace and uh, thank you for it. Thank you, Billy. I think that's it. That's it, Rochelle. I, I have a, thank you very much for doing that. That's a fun part of the program. Um, <laughs> I, I want to find, is, where is Dr. Faye Butler, our interim VP for Student Affairs? Faye, where's the mask? I thought we had a guest coming in. Outside. Yeah. Okay, we have a special guest. <laughs> uh, we're also running up against the clock. No, we, we brought, you know, in celebration of the first, in the, in the, the inaugural new season, because we brought the sports back, they were here before, of the LaGuardia Redhawks, our women's and men's basketball teams, our fall men's soccer program, our upcoming programs, we have, uh, Andy Walker, our athletic director, and Dr. Butler uh, have some, some prizes for all of you in the audience. Now, if you're tuning in uh, remotely from your office, you don't get the prize. Another reason to think about coming to opening sessions in person uh, to join this, this crowd, this sellout crowd at this event today, Rochelle, is we give away swag. So that's on its way in. Let me remember what I, I, the What are the prizes? What are the prizes? It's very, it's very, um, it's very hot inside the mascot costume. I've worn it, actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, and it's hard to breathe. So I don't, maybe the mascot is not doing that well. We had to, it was outside for an hour and a half. You wouldn't want to wear that Red Hawk head for an hour and a half, I promise you. Well, Rochelle, we'll wrap this up and the mascot will come in and distribute those goodies as we depart. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks again to the team here at LPAC, to Amy and Susan, our American Sign Language interpreters, to Gina, our executive producer, Gina harris Kevin. Thank you all for being here. Anybody submits questions, we'll get to them. Have a great afternoon and a wonderful spring semester 2023. Thank you all. <laughs>